Welcome to Fearlessly Feral Living. This is Reverend Karen broadcasting to you from the Woogie Ranch out here in the back 40 of northwestern Nevada where I'm a half an hour away from the nearest gas station and the nearest grocery store. This is a podcast devoted to using New Thought spiritual principles to ensure successful creative living. Fearlessly Feral is a focus ministry of Centers for Spiritual Living and is devoted to a vision of a world in which everyone lives fearlessly feral or, in other words, wild and free. We blend spirituality and psychology to work from the inside out to promote successful wild and free living. Our mission is to provide a strong and unshakable inner foundation that works for long-term successful living. And our purpose is activating inner self-awareness to live unlimited lives. We do this by talking about spiritual principles in practical ways so that they are applicable to everyday living. So today I want to talk about discernment. Actually, I want to talk about spiritual discernment. In everyday language, it's called how to make the absolutely best decision ever for anything that you might be wanting to make a decision on, anything you're contemplating. Spiritual discernment means making totally awesome decisions and being able to trust in your decision-making abilities. So, let's dive in, shall we? According to Linda Martella Whitsett in the book Divine Audacity, discernment is the ability not to rely upon facts, but upon principles in decision-making. Yep, that's a whammy, so I'm going to repeat it. Discernment is the ability not to rely upon facts, but upon principles in decision making. So I'm going to ask you to imagine and go ahead and stop the podcast for a minute and just imagine relying on principles and not facts in your decision making processes. Now, if you're a practical sort of person, and you like to do things like look at budgets and projections and make pros and con lists and put them into an Excel spreadsheet and then observe how nicely everything lines up on paper or not. Such a thing as basing decisions on principles may not only be foreign to you, but it might cause you to stop listening to this podcast altogether and run away never to listen to me again. But I encourage you to stick around, for I've discovered that a nice blend of weighing facts with spiritual principles is a really nice way to live fearlessly feral. The problem with considering the possibility that we base our decisions on principles rather than facts is that culturally, we're taught just the opposite. Remember those early conversations with the parental units? You know those ones where you were starting to question, what am I going to do and be when I grow up? And you told your parents that you were thinking of being an artist when you grew up. And they looked at you and they said, oh, honey, you can't make any money doing that. Why don't you get a job as a secretary? Now, I'm a woman. Secretary typically back then was a woman's job. I know misogyny exists. It still does. It did even more so back then. If you're a guy, they may have said, why don't you consider becoming a mechanic or something like that? That's not what my podcast is about today. Although if you're searching for what do you want to be when you grow up, no matter what your age is, by the way, you might want to consider the effect that societal limitations like misogyny have on you and take a really good look at whether you want to have those same same kinds of beliefs. Just because you're a woman doesn't mean you can't be a mechanic. Anyway, back to my topic. I don't know about you, but that sort of thinking, that thinking that said we should find employment based on how much money we could make, and not our passions and our desires and our strengths, That kind of thinking never made any sense to me. Somehow, intuitively, I knew that wasn't for me. Back then, I had not yet learned about new thought and things like the law of attraction and the creative power of our minds and the fact that we are at choice simply by training our minds and directing our thoughts. 
Back then I had not yet learned the truth that doing something for eight hours a day, five days a week or more, just to bring home money is not a good way to live. I just knew there was something wrong with the picture that my parental units were presenting to me. I just didn't know how to put it into words. It was just an intuitively gut-level feeling. Like most people, my parents were taught to base decisions on facts and not on principles. They were taught that women did certain things and men did certain other things. They were taught to look at the bottom line. Can you pay bills with that? If you have kids and you're only the you're the only breadwinner winner in your family and you have no nest egg. I'm not advocating that you quit your day job. What I'm saying is if you can dream it, it's achievable. And considering that dream a possibility opens up channels that were not previously open in order to make that dream become a reality. We can't even imagine the channels that line up for our good and conspire for our good unless we are willing to be open and consider things as possibility. I never had kids and although I've always been the primary breadwinner in my little family of one plus fur babies and I always insisted on paying my share of the household expenses when I was married I was always a bit outside the box. In fact some folks like to say I don't even have a box. If you're wanting to do something that those people are saying cannot be done, there are other factors to include besides the bottom line. In my experience, facts and things like the bottom line are only a very small part of the decision-making process. Basing decisions on spiritual principles is the way for us to ultimately accomplish our highest purpose in life, our soul's calling. If you like to use such phrasing... I'm saying that basing decisions upon spiritual principles is the way to do God's will in our lives. And I can't believe I just referred to God in the third person because I don't normally do that. But I recognize that people, many people, use this phrase. So there you have it. If you like it, use it. The way to do God's will in your life is to base your decision-making processes on spiritual principles. So, If we're basing our decision-making process on spiritual principles rather than facts, it's helpful to know what spiritual principles are. And I have a handy list of them. Actually, I have several lists. The first list is taught by Centers for Spiritual Living in a class called, wait for it, Spiritual Principles and Practices. Sometimes our titles are not that imaginative. It's a great class, though, and I've taught it before. Here's the list of spiritual principles according to Centers for Spiritual Living. Oneness, love, creation, threefold nature, creative process, spiritual beings, freedom, heaven, and eternal life. Now before I get into some other language here that makes sense out of those things, here's some other lists. Honesty, hope, Faith, courage, integrity, willingness, humility, unconditional love, justice, perseverance, spirituality, and service. Now, if you recognize these words, you are one of my kindred spirits because these are the principles behind the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And they have a matching step to go with each one of those principles. Imagine that. (laughs) Oh my goodness. I'm a bit sarcastic and mischievous today. So anyway, thinking in terms of principles can also lead us to think sometimes of things like woo-woo and airy-fairy. I mean, what does all this stuff mean anyway? So I want to bring it back to earth a bit. Think of principles as sort of like mission statements. Businesses and organizations use and create and use mission statements. And if they are behaving in integrity, which is another spiritual principle, by the way, which they're, with their mission statements, they don't do anything unless it fits within the parameters of the mission statement. Every potential decision gets run past that mission statement. If it fits, they're good to go. If it doesn't, it's back to the drawing board. 
The cool thing is that we get to decide what our principles in life are. This is a good exercise for us to do because it tells us much about ourselves. And in knowing ourselves better, guess what? We also know God better because of the spiritual principle of oneness. See how I did that? <laughs> it's a full, full circle there. The spiritual principle of oneness says that God is everywhere present, including and especially in and as us. In my belief, spiritual principles always begin and end with oneness. That's the foundational principle. And depending on what we do or do not believe about oneness, it has a lot of ramifications as to how we live our lives. Let me expand on oneness a little bit. For me, oneness means a couple things. One, it means that there is one God, one spirit, one stuff that is, one universe, one force. I don't care what you call it. Part of that equation is that God is everywhere present in and as all things. A part of me and I am a part of it. God is not a separate guy in the sky type of thing under the principle of oneness. And all sorts of cool things result from living in and believing in this principle. For example, because of oneness and behind oneness, the truth that God is a part of me and I am a part of it. Guess what? I have the power to create what I wish in my life. Because God is a part of me and I have the same power that God has. My words have power. Remember this as we continue our discussion on spiritual decision, discernment. The other part of oneness is that because God is everywhere present and in me, it's also in you. And yeah, it's in that guy. And yeah, it's even in that person over there. You know, that one. God is everywhere. So if we are busy judging or attacking them because they're idiots, guess what? We're also attacking ourselves in some way because of oneness. This also means that if one segment of the population is disenfranchised or limited because of bigotry or prejudice or misogyny, we're all hurting just as much because we're all connected on this very deep level. Diversity and inclusion is essential because of oneness. So I believe in oneness and I've become empowered behind embodying oneness in my life. Oneness is the foundation upon which all other things build in my life. All my decisions and all my beliefs stem from the belief in oneness. Always oneness. And it doesn't matter if I'm considering such a life-changing decision as what to do for a living or something a bit less large than that, such as whether or not to go to that social gathering. Oneness is the thing that tells me that because God or spirit or whatever you want to call it is everywhere present, it's also present in me. Not only that, but I'm present in it. We are one. And just for your contemplative pleasure... I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that we humans are the way that God gets to experience the physical. Yep, I'm going to repeat that. We humans are one of the ways that God gets to experience the physical. Now, for those of you who are saying, oh my God, this woman is just too much. She's just too blasphemous for me. I'm out of here. Stick around. I'm going to encourage you to stick around again. I can say things like that because of the principle of oneness. And if you believe that God is everywhere present and in you and in me, then consider that it's simply a logical step up or inward or deeper to consider that God experiences the physical through us. Oneness as a spiritual principle tells me I had better be the best little godling that I can be during my time here on earth. Now, what does this have to do with discernment and decision making? 
If I'm a part of God and God is a part of me, then I need to do what is necessary to stay connected with that thing called God or spirit or universe or the force. And I need to stay plugged into that wisdom because let's face it, sometimes the wisdom tells us things that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But if we're practicing oneness, if we're plugged in, then not only can we hear those messages, but we have the courage and the faith and the trust to act on them, even if they don't make sense on paper, because we're plugged in. I practice the principle of oneness sometimes by asking myself, what would God do? You could also ask yourself, what would Jesus do? And I'm talking about the real live Jesus, the guy who lived by spiritual principles and told us that we could do everything he did and more. Not the guy depicted in fundamentalist, dominion-based Christianity. Don't get me started on that. That's several podcasts worth of soapbox right there, and I'm not going to go there for this podcast. Back to my topic. I practice this principle a lot by reminding myself that one of the qualities of spirit most mentioned in lists of qualities of spirit is love. So I ask myself, what would love do? Unconditional, non-judgmental love. By the way, there's also lists of qualities of spirit for you guys who like lists. And you guessed it. I have a list of those qualities. I made it myself. And I refer to them a lot in my practice of oneness. And I go beyond that. I don't only, I not only refer to them, I rely on them. I attempt to embody them. And I ask myself, what would love do? Qualities of spirit can be like guides for us. So here's my list of qualities of spirit, and then I'll give you some others. Love, power, wisdom, joy, and peace. That's my list. Here's some other lists. Love, peace, joy, freedom, abundance, balance, beauty, love, order, power, unity, wholeness, wisdom. So you might be seeing some commonalities here. Love is a biggie. Here's Charles Fillmore's list. For those of you who don't know, Charles Fillmore is the founder of Unity. His list is life, truth, love, intelligence, soul, spirit, and principle. Here's Ernest Holmes' list. Ernest Holmes is the founder of Centers for Spiritual Living and a teaching called Science of Mind, which is what I'm teaching right here. Ernest Holmes' list, love, wisdom, intelligence, power, substance, and mind. So what do all these lists have to do with oneness? Well, they're qualities of spirit. And if it is true that because of oneness, spirit is a part of us, then we get to be these qualities. We get to embody them. We envision them. We envision in our minds what they look like and feel like, and then we act that out. The more we can be these qualities of spirit, the more we can experience oneness. And the more we can experience oneness, the more we can feel things like peace and joy and unconditional love and faith and that knowingness that all is well. So we've embodied qualities of spirit. We're experiencing oneness. We have that sweet, absolutely joyful, most beautiful connection with whatever we want to call God. And we're faced with a decision. Now, we've made the pro and con list. We've done the budget. By the way, some people go so far as to eliminate those steps from the decision-making process. I used to do that. I said, no, don't need no pro and con list. Don't need no budget. I'm just going for it. Well, I'm a little more in balance now. And I have to laugh at myself sometimes because I like a bit of balance in my life. I go into situations now knowing the numbers and there's a certain amount of freedom in that. I've got the facts. I've done the research. And then I take a deeper dive into the land of spiritual discernment. And so I sit with it a while. And while I'm sitting in it with it, I let it stew in my consciousness. Some folks call this slow cooking, and the, the analogy works for me. While it's stewing in that slow cooker, I periodically check in and ask myself, what am I feeling about this? Not what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling. 
Feelings are things like excited and hopeful and enthusiastic. Feelings are sometimes centered in the body as a physical thing. Now, if you feel like you have a basketball in your stomach at the thought of deciding one way, (laughs) that's really good information to have. If the basketball goes away at the opposite thought, that's also really good information to have. That's your gut speaking to you on more ways than one. That's your intuition. Listen to that. Those things don't lie. Heed them. If you're feeling incredible tension in your neck, that's also good information. All those kinds of feelings are telling us a big fat no to whatever it is we're considering. On the other hand, if you can take a deep, easy breath at the thought of a yes to any decision you are contemplating, then go for it. Or if you feel like there's been a weight lifted off your shoulders at the thought of a decision, then go for it. And remember, thoughts are not feelings. Thoughts are more like opinions. You know those. Everybody has them. Sort of like that other thing that everybody has. Now that other thing, it serves a really good purpose for us. So do thoughts. If that other thing isn't working properly, there are things we can do to fix it, like eat more vegetables or take a laxative or do the opposite. Likewise, if our thoughts aren't working properly, in other words, they're not serving us We can fix those too. We can change them. Not with a pill though. We change them by actively acknowledging that we have them. And we then we consciously discern what we would like to think instead. And then one thought at a time, we replace the thoughts that no longer serve us with thoughts that do. Without judgment, without shaming ourselves or belittling ourselves or jumping on ourselves and attacking ourselves. We don't do that. We just change them one thought at a time. And while feelings are always valid and give us good information, thoughts may or may not be true. And they may be the result of an old story or a fear or a belief that was installed in us by a parental unit or society that we no longer believe in. Or our ego popping up because it's feeling threatened because we're wanting to change the status quo. And the ego's job is to protect us at all costs, even to the point of making us think fearful things so we don't change. Because the ego does not like change. It is threatened by change. So the way to deal with that ego is to thank it and reassure it. After all, we're now part of a one, a greater, bigger more powerful thing than any old ego. Thanks, ego, for sharing, but we got this. Come along for the ride. That's what I tell my ego. Thanks for sharing, but we got this. Anyway, so I've got my list of pros and cons, and my list of cons is better than my list of pros, and I need to not do this, but I have news for you. If you came up with the idea in the first place, the yes is in the idea. Because where on earth do you think those ideas come from? If we're practicing oneness, they came from the God within each and every one of us, nudging and poking at us to take a look at this thing so we can be elevated to our next greatest level of existence. If we have an idea, there is a way to implement. Now, The ways which we might be currently thinking about implementing it might not be working. We may be getting called upon to think differently about how to implement this idea. But the yes is always in the idea. I even have a workshop called that, by the way. The yes is in the idea. And we don't think about this stuff. We feel it. So if you're feeling excited and enthusiastic and hopeful about what you're contemplating, discernment says we need to take that idea seriously, no matter how scary it is. Because really, all those pros and cons lists, the budget stuff, relatively unimportant in the overall scheme of things. But until we fully embody oneness and begin to use that spiritual principle as a foundation, We will always come back to that cultural imperative that says we must make decisions based on facts. Do you see how important oneness is here? 
So consider spiritual principles with at least as much importance, if not more, than facts. So I have a couple stories to tell you to illustrate this. Once upon a time, about 25 years ago, I got a divorce. Which meant I needed to find a new place to live because the house we lived in, well, let's just say I lived there because my husband wanted to live there, not me. I was totally okay with moving out. So I proceeded to look for a place to live. Not coincidentally, I also needed either a place in my new living quarters to house my very successful photography business, which was at that time about 10 years old, or I needed to find a space for the business as well. Up popped this property. It just fell right in my lap. It was two parcels. One zoned residential with the cutest little cabin on it. And right next door was the commercial building, zone commercial. Also very cute. Those two parcels were selling together. But home lenders wouldn't give me the money for the commercial property and vice versa. So I needed to get two separate loans. I could get a loan for the house. I couldn't get a loan for the commercial. The numbers weren't adding up. The number crunchers were basing their decisions on facts. Me? I was basing my decisions on the feelings I got when I looked at the property. So much excitement and so much potential there. I actually had one banker tell me, she said, you know, you've got a lot of ideas here, but it's all pie in the sky. There's no facts behind these ideas. And I'm like, yeah, that's the whole point. She didn't give me the money either. (laughs) I knew a secret the numbers crunchers did not know. I knew that if I built it, they would come. And I knew this as strongly as I knew I needed air, breathe, and water to live. I got turned down for the loan on the commercial building again and again and again, and my realtor wasn't being helpful, so I fired her and got a different one. Because honestly, realtors can make or break a sale. I wasn't taking no for an answer on this. And a friend who was a mortgage broker looked me straight in the eye and told me he would not loan me the money because he didn't think I would be able to make the payments. Well, guys, I got to tell you, with friends like that, I don't need enemies. I need supportive friends, people who believe in my visions. Now, that's a pretty hard boundary with me and may be the subject for another podcast. But I knew this was my place. The money to purchase it, however, was going to have to come from a non-traditional source because the traditional numbers crunchers weren't going for it. Now, this kind of thinking takes confidence. It takes trust. It takes a willingness to step into unknown territory. It takes a willingness to face up to the doubters and say, no, you are wrong. It takes all that stuff that makes most of us really uncomfortable. And I was at that place. Honestly, it took years of practice to get to that place. This doesn't happen overnight. But I had been doing spiritual practices and practicing oneness for about 10 years by that time. I was able to step into a bigger place in my mind. And I had the foundation of a strong spiritual practice to make my decisions based on discernment rather than facts. You can call that advanced spirituality if you want. I don't know. Anyway, I got a traditional loan for the house. And a private lender who knew me and was familiar with my vision came through and lent me the money for the commercial property. I had no idea that woman had that kind of money. But there she was, showing up for me in a huge way, supporting me. Now that's the kind of friend I'm talking about. I bought this place and what followed was almost 20 years of my photography business becoming the most successful one in my area and my home becoming a safe haven for folks needing a quiet space just to hang out. I'd go off on a shoot and come home to discover someone hanging out in my garden. I'd go off somewhere and come home to discover that another friend had spent time there and done some weeding. I had the most successful potlucks in that little cabin. I had all kinds of events at my studio. 
during my time in that place, I became a practitioner and I turned part of my studio into a classroom and I started holding classes and events and workshops in my studio. Buying that property was based solely on spiritual principle, not on numbers, and it was one of the best sp- decisions I ever made. If I had heeded the numbers, I never would have bought that property, and who knows where I'd be now. Here's one more story for you to illustrate how successful it could be basing your decisions on spiritual principle rather than facts. I'm a minister. I'm a minister with Centers for Spiritual Living. Now, when I was contemplating going to grad school and becoming a minister, becoming a minister made absolutely no sense on paper. Not only that, it made no sense in my belief system or in my thoughts or in my feelings. None of it made any sense. There was a little part of me that was a little disappointed when I realized none of it was making any sense. But the facts were so large and in my face. I, you know, I said maybe later, but not now. It was a not yet for me. So, I have these people in my life. These people in my life were telling me different. They were saying, you have to go to ministerial school. You have to do it. And there's another spiritual principle at play here, and it's called openness or willingness, or maybe a combination of both. At the time, I knew the photography business was winding down in my life. The photography industry was changing and things weren't just working for me anymore. I was not happy with the direction the industry had gone in and I was not willing to follow that direction. And so I knew my photography business was winding down. And here's these people telling me I had to become a minister. Now, I'm going to come clean here and tell you a little secret about myself. If more than three people that I know and trust and respect, and that's key, respect and trust, tell me I ought to be doing something different, I listen to them. And way more than three people were telling me I needed to become a minister. So I listened to them. And even though it made no sense and every part of me was resisting it, I listened. Because I was open and willing The way to go back to grad school opened up and I was fully supported on that journey all through school and I became a minister. And here I am today doing a podcast and serving as an interim minister for Centers for Spiritual Living and writing and creating and doing wonderful things. And life as a minister is more incredibly wonderful than I ever could have imagined it. And I have fully and completely let go of my previous life as a photographer. When at one time my entire identity was wrapped up. I didn't just do photography. I was photography. So things can change in huge ways for us. Here's yet one more little story for you. And this one is really recent. A couple weeks ago, actually it's been a couple months now, I bought a travel trailer. Now, On paper, the facts don't add up. I don't leave my home much because, well, horses. I have two horses and they need daily care. I've never owned a travel trailer before and I don't know much about them. And quite frankly, the idea of owning said travel trailer is a bit anxiety producing because I'm still dealing with some PTSD resulting from about 10 years of constant change and huge life changes. But I bought the trailer anyway because... Something inside of me was telling me to go for it. And I felt enthusiastic about it, and I felt excited about it. And I felt like it was the next indicated right step in an intuitive way. So I bought this trailer. It's a 22-year-old trailer, but it's in wonderful, perfect condition. And I towed it home, and I proceeded to try and unhook the damn thing from my truck. Now, unhooking and hooking my horse trailer is a no-brainer. It's simple. The travel trailer... Not so simple. It's got levelers and stabilizers and more chains to unhook than you can shake a stick at. And it's got this metal tire stopper thingy that goes in between the two tires to stop them from moving. My horse trailer has a couple of blocks. That's it. So I got stuck 
at the very first step, which is trying to put this little metal tire stopper thingy in between the tires. It wouldn't work. Turns out it was broken. I didn't know that. So I got support. A friend suggested I get a different sort of tire stopper thingy. So I did, and they work fine. And then I got stuck again at the very next step. Now, I had a list of directions that the previous owner had texted me. And I looked at those directions and I just had to sit down and laugh because his directions were void of punctuation and ripe with typos and I suspect some wrong words. They made absolutely no sense whatsoever. So I went to YouTube and I looked at those directions and I found some videos and they walked me through the proper procedure to unhook a travel trailer. But I was still stuck. And I realized I needed someone to come over and supervise me while I did the deal. And so I did what's really difficult to do, and I asked for help. I'm getting much, much better at that, by the way. My tractor guy came over and helped. Now, when you own a 2.5-acre ranchette, you either have your own tractor or you have a tractor guy. I have a tractor guy. This guy has talent in spades. He's now my main handyman and car oil changer, and he also moves hay bales for me. Anyway, tractor guy came over, and he did what I asked which was, do not do it for me. Show me and let me do it. Now, misogyny rears its ugly head here because men like to get in there and do it for us. Do not let them do it for you. Ah, He's really good about this. Really, really good. He did what I asked. We went out to the trailer and we looked at the trailer and he said, okay, unhook that thingy. And I did. And then he said, okay, now unhook that thingy, and I did. And he said, now watch out that that chain doesn't walk back and and whack you upside the, the leg. And so, you know, he's giving me cautionary things. He walked me through every step of the way. And once he had a little slip and he began to do him, do it himself, and I said, don't touch that, Jeremy. And he went, oh, yeah, right, sorry. So he walked me through the entire process, and I got that trailer unhooked and leveled, and life was good. And then he said, let him know when I was ready to hook up the trailer and take it on my maiden voyage, which is going to be to Topaz Lake, which is about 10 miles away from me. I'm going to go to a close place and do this thing and have a like a rehearsal camping trip. He said he would come over again and guide me through hooking it up and follow me to Topaz and help me there as well. And I'm so excited about this. So now I'm putting stuff in my trailer and decorating it and soon I will take my maiden voyage. And with this purchase, I recognize that I'm stepping into an unknown place, which could be scary. It's scary for us to step into an unknown place. But I have support. I have faith. I have trust. And I have oneness. And that's all we need in life, really. That's really all we need. So the next time you're contemplating a decision, I encourage you to step into a deeper place and connect with whatever your concept of spirit is and see what feelings crop up and place just as much importance on those feelings in the decision-making process as you do on the factual side of things. This is the way to move beyond current limitations in our lives and into something new and wonderful and bigger than we ever dreamed. Just practice discernment in your decision-making process. So I thank you for listening and I hope you've been able to become willing to explore making decisions in a different way because it will open up new and wonderful things for you. And I am knowing right here and right now that spirit, that thing I like to call the force, is everywhere present, moving in and as and through me. And because of that, I know the words I speak now are powerful beyond measure. And so I speak now that there is more to making decisions than facts. There is an energy, a force, a power behind the facts that says, yes, we can do this. Yes, you can do this. This energy is the one that creates the excitement within us. I am speaking right here and right now that with this energy, we have the power to implement our ideas, our ideas, and the ways to do so simply open up effortlessly. I am speaking my word right now that all is well and all continues to be well. And with great gratitude, I release my word knowing 
It is done, and so it is. And I thank you very much for listening. You can check out Fearlessly Feral Living at our website, fearlesslyferal.org. Again, we are a focused ministry of Centers for Spiritual Living, and your support is much appreciated and fully tax-deductible. You can support us in a number of different ways. One way is by going to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash fearlesslyferal, and becoming a member. Or you can donate at our PayPal page. Karen Lindsley NV is our PayPal uh, tag, I guess you can call it. And once again, website, fearlesslyferal.org. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.